Okay, hello and welcome to this webcast. This is Ed Scotus. Uh, I am happy to uh, see all of you folks here for our webcast on Friday afternoon. Um, Good Friday, as a matter of fact. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had the honor of meeting yet, uh, my name is Ed Scotus and I am an instructor with the Sands Institute. Uh, I'm also the pen test curriculum lead, and we've got something really special to share with you today. I am not the speaker on this webcast. Um, in fact, you've got somebody really, really cool to talk with you on this webcast. It's going to be Mike Murr. I've known Mike for many years. Um, gosh, it's probably over 10 years or so, and he is an exceptional SANS instructor and security practitioner. He knows um, stuff at a really deep fashion. I remember back years ago uh, when we were working our, on our virtual machine escape project back in 2007, Mike Murr and I would sit down and start brainstorming about different ways to try to break out of VMware. And he had some really cool and insightful ideas even way back then. This was 2007. Since then, he's really done some incredible stuff. He, um, he does a lot of malware analysis. He does a lot of red team and penetration testing stuff. He does a lot with social engineering. The guy is fantastic. Um, he is going to be teaching the SANS Security 560 course. That's on network pen testing and ethical hacking. He's going to be teaching that at the SANS Security West event coming up uh, actually in May. It'll be May 4th through 12th. So it's about a month from, what, tomorrow, I guess. Um, he's going to be teaching the class. I recommend you check it out. Um, so you, if you go to uh, sans.org slash security west, as you see at the footer of this particular slide, um, this security west event that we've got will have a whole bunch of different classes. I mean, it's one of the big events. It's in San Diego during the springtime. It's totally gorgeous. Um, Mike's going to be teaching the 560 course on network pen testing, and there's also going to be a lot of other evening sessions where they're going to talk about emerging trends in cybersecurity. So what are the trends happening in uh, offensive stuff. What are the trends happening in defensive stuff? It's a neat thing, and SAN Security West is the sponsor of the webcast that you're about to hear. So could we go to the next slide, please, so I can kind of transition over to, uh, to Mr. Murr, if we wouldn't mind switching the slides forward? Cool. So, so Mike Murr, I, I, I contacted him, and I said, hey, Mike, uh, you know, let's do a webcast and do something really interesting and useful for pen testers. And Mike suggested, well, what if we talk a little bit about ways that you can practically apply Python to uh, address many situations that come up in pen testing? And he specifically said, what if, we, what if we show people sort of the logical progression of how you could build an account harvester and password guesser in Python? And I said, that's a really cool thing. I'd love to see that. Um, he put these slides together. It's really quite a compelling uh, set of ideas, and uh, I'd like to transition over to Mike. So the, the, the way this webcast is going to flow is Mike's going to be presenting for the next, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, giving you these concepts. If you have any questions, you can type them directly into um, the, the, the screen that you have here for GoToMeeting. We're going to save those questions for Q&A at the end, but if you type them in, I'll go ahead and, and you know, store them. Um, and then I'll ask those questions of Mike during the Q&A session at the end. And again, thank you guys for joining us. We really do, uh, we do appreciate your, your being here and hope to give you some cool stuff to think about and, uh, and to incorporate into your own red teaming, pen testing, and general security practices. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Murr, are you ready to roll? Uh, yes, I am. Here he goes, Mike Murr. All right, well, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome again to uh, today's wonderful uh, webcast. Uh, as, as Ed mentioned, my name is Mike Murr. Uh, I do spend quite a bit of time uh, bouncing around between doing things such as uh, uh, malware analysis, some red teaming, uh, and quite a bit of social engineering as well. So without much further ado, uh, uh, let's talk about today's, uh, the topic of today's webcast, which is uh, using Python to kind of enhance your, enhance your pen tests and, and take the um, Take the situations where perhaps you're encountering some type of uh, uh, cu uh, custom web application or, or custom customer environment, where sometimes your automated tools or some of your pre-built tools just don't quite fit the bill. And the goal of today's presentation, the walk away from, or uh, really is about how to apply these concepts. Um, but at the end of, uh, by the end of basically the time we've developed these two tools, what we'll actually have for a 
pretend got for one of our pseudo customers will be a set of user credentials. And the idea is that the reason we're focusing on this right now is because user credentials are something that's very, very common, as you all know, uh, that you need during a pen test. Uh, they can be used for several different things, but quite often they're usually used as part of gaining some initial type of foothold. Now, in terms of getting an initial foothold, there are several different options you have and some fantastic tools out there. Right? Even in terms of password guessers, there's tools like Hydra. Um, Metasploit has a number of different options, right? not just for gaining access to a system or initially gaining control, but also exploiting and taking advantage of what you have, and then, of course, post-exploitation. Burp Suite's also a fantastic tool, uh, a set of tools, uh, and there's a number of other ones as well. But the one of the main uh, uh, issues, and this is true with any tool, no matter who it is, whether you've written it or any other tool, is that any type of pre-built tool can only go so far. And at some point in time, you're going to encounter uh, uh, scenarios with a customer where they've either got some custom application or they've changed the environment just enough that the pre-built tools don't quite work as expected. And it's important to be able to to still be able to respond and effectively provide value for that customer by being able to adapt to their changing environment, right? Because at the end of the day, the especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, APT-style uh, adversaries, they've got time on their side. They're going to take time to adapt to the to on, to their target, which means we need to be able to take the time and provide the value so that, uh, and adapt to our customer, so that way the customer can be better uh, be better prepared. So. Uh, the examples we talk about today, they're focused on web-based applications. Why? Because web-based applications are very, very popular, as everyone is well aware. Plus, uh, they're very easy to interact with, especially from Python. Now, everything we talk about will, uh, even though it's, it's the examples are web-based applications, they apply no matter what type of network-based server and or, or tool you're talking about. So if the customer has developed a, let's say, custom application with a with their own unique network protocol and, and you know, uh, stuff like that, you could by all means take the exact same principles and process and apply it to, to that to their specific environment. However, it might take some additional steps to develop custom, uh, uh, the, the network interaction and that type of thing. However, again, the principles are, are exactly the same no matter where you go. So speaking of today's customer, Right, it's uh, our our pseudo customer for today is going to, is actually called pseudo random. Yes, the customer's name is pseudo random because they're a pseudo customer. Uh, and what does what does pseudo random do? Well, they sell pseudo random numbers. In fact, they even have their own website, pseudorandom.org. As you can see, it's got a very nice scrolling website. A little bar at the top it says because pseudo random isn't enough, pseudo random numbers, how you need them, when you need them. Very flashy website. In fact, it says with our pseudo random numbers, you won't lose your head. How creative. They even have pseudo random servers with a complete solution and a pseudo random guarantee. Tiered monthly pricing. By the way, uh, this customer is the Despite the fictitious nature of the, of the customer pseudo random, it's actually based on a number of customers, uh, both across uh, uh, pub, or excuse me, private and uh, government sector that we've that we've come across, or that we've done either pen tests for or uh, uh, incident response and investigations for. A number of these, uh, uh, the a number of the, I guess you could say vulnerabilities that we'll see today, very very common. Unfortunately, too common. All right. And even, like every good uh, internet marketing site, should have pseudo-random uh, uh, testimonials. If you look at these prices, I mean, just out of control, look at this, $100 for unlimited pseudo-random numbers a month. These guys are going to put dev random out of business. Sorry, I know cheesy jokes. All right. And here we have their sign-up page. Is that the way? Just a sec. There we go. So it looks like this is a page that we can go ahead and use to sign up for a pseudo random customer. We'll come back to this in just a few minutes. Yeah. Now, in terms of environment, pseudo random, uh, they run a classic LAMP stack. That's Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, it's a pretty common environment. You see it a lot, especially, uh, surprisingly, actually, with a large number or with a fair number of large corporations. Uh, WordPress, uh, the, the LAMP stack, especially with things like WordPress and Drupal, very, very common partly due to the uh, low initial cost and because it's so popular and there's so many tools to help uh, maintain it, it's a fairly low maintenance cost as well. Not all, now, granted, not everyone uses LAMP, 
um, LAMP stacks. I mean, there are a number of IIS installations and stuff like that. And also, sometimes during a pen test, this may not be their primary website, uh, a LAMP stack, but you will often see it when it comes to development environments, especially when it's one of those things where they want, where a dev wants to stand, uh, work on a PHP app, and they want to stand up a LAMP stack real fast. There's a number of scripts out there and pre-built ISOs that allow you to have a, 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 a Linux Apache MySQL PHP environment up and running in minutes. Now, the specific software that we'll take a look at in this uh, uh, scenario will be WordPress. Why? Because WordPress is incredibly common. Um, we find it all the time. Uh, surprisingly, as we mentioned before, you find it on, on a, a, the primary website for a large number of uh, um, uh, corporate customers. And we also see it a lot of times internally used. So you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, either doing some type of sweep uh, from outside the network, or perhaps you've gained some initial foothold, perhaps someone you know, ran one of your interpreter reverse shells. You take a link around the inside of the network, and you're looking to spread laterally. And all of a sudden, we start finding all these internal servers. Well, as it turns out, people are using these for various either corporate blogs, like internal blogging project uh, type of uh, management resources, that type of thing. So there's a number of uses for WordPress, but you still see it very, very commonly. And if you go to the web page, they talk about there's several million installations of, of uh, WordPress alone. Now, in this specific environment, uh, the pseudo-random customer, pseudo-random, will uh, uh, they've uh, chosen WordPress, but they've also got another third-party plugins. They've also specifically got a membership plugin, which does have some security features, so it takes it a little bit beyond just your straight vanilla WordPress install. And I mention this is because it's quite common, uh, especially if you start taking a look at WordPress and looking at some of the security uh, approaches that WordPress has taken. There's a lot of security that's actually not baked into WordPress, so it's not uncommon to have third-party plugins. Also, from just a pure pen testing perspective, when it comes to attacking web apps, especially if they've got like a, a WordPress installation, the WordPress core is actually, in terms of code security, is, is quite good. However, it's usually these third-party plugins where you've got your SQL injection, your command injection, all sorts of fun stuff like that. So let's first off talk about building an account harvester. So the whole idea behind our account harvesting is that it's, it's based on the idea of being able to determine a list of valid user IDs. So we'll start off, our goal of this is to get a list of user IDs that we can then feed into password guessing. And again, it all ties back to the initial goal of getting a set of valid user credentials. Now, the way account harvesting works is it's based on a very simple principle of being able to differentiate between when we have a valid user ID and an invalid user ID. Uh, and what we're going to do is look for a web page that allows us to figure out the difference between the two. Now, we're assuming in both cases that when we say valid user ID versus invalid user ID, that the password is invalid in both cases. Um, otherwise, if you've got a valid user ID with a valid password, there's not much need to go, there's not much need to go further um, in terms of get, trying to get user credentials. You already got some. Unless, of course, you're trying to get more. Now, when it comes to account harvesting, since we mentioned the goal of this really is to just get uh, user IDs, which we can then feed into a password guesser, there are a number of other options besides just account harvesting. And sometimes account harvesting isn't always the best option, and we'll see why some of the specifics, some of the things that might either alert a customer, which actually hopefully they would catch it, but unfortunately many don't, um, as well as perhaps it's either out of the scope of, uh, it's out of, the scope of, uh, of, of work or, or beyond the rules of engagement, that type of thing. However, uh, beyond account harvesting, you also have, uh, for instance, reconnaissance, going through searching through the target organization's website. Um, it's not uncommon, especially for some of your larger organizations, for them to have how-to guides, uh, user documents, or even sometimes company directories, that type of thing, where they actually will casually or indirectly, or sometimes even directly in the case of the uh, corporate directory, mention user IDs, user emails, uh, which in many cases, if the user ID is based off the user email, it's almost just as good. Alternatively, and this is always a good thing that we do during uh, um, part of our recon for, for uh, red team assessments, is going through and checking to see if the customer has already been compromised and someone else has already, uh, has already unfortunately done the work uh, and posted the results. Now, this would be uh, going through taking a look at things like Pastebin and a number of other related sites. Now, in terms of doing a pen test, if you discover that your customer has been compromised ahead of time, uh, there are some ethical concerns that you may want, to, may want to address with them before you get started or, or when you first find this out. But in terms of generating a list of valid user IDs, if someone else has already done the work, technically that would count as well, as well as social engineering. And this is always kind of interesting because when we talk about social engineering, many people tend to, tend to restrict it to the, the classic approach of you know, calling up and trying to get a password and stuff like that. 
the stuff that Kevin uh, uh, Kevin Mitnick wrote about in the book uh, Art of Deception and stuff like that. Random little tidbit, by the way, about Kevin. Um, he and I actually used to live across the street from each other in Thousand Oaks, like no joke. Um, it was actually quite interesting, especially since when I bumped into him, I had I had just uh, started off uh, doing some stuff with Sans. Very unique fellow, very interesting guy. Um, I'm also friends with uh, uh, several of the law enforcement members that have worked his case, and let's just say there's definitely two sides to each story. Um, but the reason I mention social engineering is because think about our security awareness programs. How often do we tell users in our security awareness programs not to reveal their passwords over their phone, not to enter their passwords, not to click on links, that type of stuff? Hopefully fairly often, right? That's a fairly common thing during security awareness training. And it's good. However, how often do we tell our users don't reveal your username, don't reveal your user, identi uh, your user ID or your, your uh, employee ID number? Not nearly as often, if at all. And now, the reason we say that is because in many cases, we focus on the quote-unquote sensitive information as being the password, that type of thing. However, if we, if we look at it from the perspective of conducting a pen test, right, pen testing is not just like hacking in the movies where, you know, you've got, you know, some zero-day exploit, you know, you launch it just like how Trinity hacked the IRS base, all that cool stuff. In reality, it's about gaining little, uh, little footholds or getting an initial foothold and using that to expand your access, gaining a little bit more access and so on and so forth. Now you might be doing things like dumping password hashes along the way and then cracking them offline. Perhaps that's how you gain a little bit more access. Perhaps it's part of lateral movement. Perhaps it's turning around and pivoting from the inside. But the idea is the same. It's all about gaining a little bit more access and, and using that to get further to whatever your goal is. And with social engineering, if we talk about uh, uh, getting the user ID out of the, uh, or social engineering the user ID out of the user, Right? Again, that's getting us a little bit closer and so on and so forth. So even these small pieces of information from a security perspective can co compose quite a, uh, quite, ri quite a big risk to the customer. So let's take a look at an example, uh, a login page, to see what we mean by account harvesting. So we'll actually go to the WordPress login page for pseudo-random. And the idea, as we mentioned with account harvesting, is being able to tell the difference between when we have a valid user ID and an invalid user ID. So if we enter a valid user ID, we'll just say for right now that uh, uh, we'll use the, the valid user ID lost, we'll enter some random password, no, this is not my password, uh, and click login. Notice it says, oops, not now. We'll talk about password managers in another webcast. All right, so it says, error, the password you entered for the username is incorrect. Notice what it's telling us right here. It says the password is the incorrect portion of it. That alone is really revealing to us that we had a valid username. However, let's say we just try some invalid user ID, just some random garbage. Hopefully that's not a valid user ID. And it says invalid username. This is invalid username, again, telling us what the invalid portion was. And that's our whole goal is to be able to differentiate between those two. Now, you might be saying this is, well, quite an obvious type of thing to fix. And we'll discuss some of the uh, ways customers can address this uh, when it comes to uh, the, the latter portion of this webcast. But as you can see conceptually, it's actually quite simple. It's being able to differentiate between these two. Now, by the way, this is a classic vanilla WordPress uh, login page. I didn't do any, none of the plugins that I've installed for this demonstration actually affect the login page or the login message itself. So if you've just got a vanilla WordPress installation, this is, I mean, it's literally on the login page that, and, that someone can get this type of information. So in order to write our account harvester, we need to know a few things about our target organization, or at least their particular web environment. First of all, we need to figure out what the user ID is formatted, how it's formatted. Uh, do they allow email addresses? You know, what what is the first half of that thing we're trying to guess? Now, sometimes we'll figure that out. Uh, we may need to do additional things like reconnaissance. So, for instance, if the user ID is actually their email address, then we need to figure out, okay, what are some possible email addresses that we can try and guess with here? The next, uh, another uh, approach is to see if there's some type of predictable pattern. Is it based on a social security number or a student identifier or a user numeric identifier? In which case, all of these, uh, especially if they follow some type of predictable pattern, such as all numeric, 
a classic one that you see a lot of, it, for instance, at a lot of .edu's, is where the student, uh, the student identifier is either the social security number, which in and of itself is just a bad idea. And luckily, a number of universities I've seen lately have moved away from that specifically just because of the uh, privacy concerns. But also, uh, instead, the student identifier will be some type of just straight-up number. So for instance, it might be 00138572, which from a uh, privacy perspective, that's fine. It's not your social. However, from a pen test perspective, it's great because it's easy for us to predict the pattern. We literally just go in sequence. So what we're going to do is generate a list of possible user IDs, figure out what format they need to be in, and then find some page that allows us to differentiate between the two, between when we submit a, a user ID if it becomes valid or if it's invalid. Now, this page that we submit the uh, user IDs to, we need something that basically, as we mentioned, we submit the user IDs, but somehow that we can examine the response and that we will be able to differentiate between the two. And then once we find this vulnerable page, this page that we'll be using as kind of the uh, primary page we submit to in our account harvester, we'll need to go down and note some relevant pieces of information. For instance, what form fields need to be submitted back and forth? Are there cookies, session identifiers, that type of thing? So let's take a look at the web page for these, uh, the sign-up page, the account creation page, excuse me, for pseudo random. Let's purchase. All right. So as we can see here, this is the page to sign up and purchase a plan from pseudo-random. So it says, use this form to sign up. All that good stuff. Now, it says, once your account is approved, we'll send you a link to complete the billing information. So uh, obviously, email, things of that nature are going to be important. But what's really important to us as pen testers is notice this part right here, which is user ID. It's a three-value or three-digit numeric value. So let's take a look at a few of these and see if we can notice the consistent pattern. Again, a three-digit value, 294. And it appears to change each time the page is loaded. One thing I also want to point out, and this, is, this will become important when we start writing the code, is that notice when we have a number, let's say, less than 100. So in this case, it's 72. Notice there's a leading zero. This is important if they format their usernames, if their user, ID, if their user IDs are actually strings stored in the database. Because in which case, 072, the string, which is three characters, is not the same as the string of two characters, 72. Numerically, as numbers, they're identical. But when it, comes term, when it comes time to actually trying to log in, you need to submit whatever it is the database is going to check for. Now also notice that the user cannot easily change this value. This is set to be a read-only value. So it looks like pseudo-random, unsurprisingly, is generating pseudo-random user IDs. So if we continue uh, sampling the page a few more times, we can see it's always going to be some three-digit value. So what we've effectively found is some easy to predict user identifiers, meaning we found some predictable pattern. And what we'll do in our case is we'll simply just make a, a, a little for loop that'll go from 0 to 999. And we'll format each one as a string with three characters and try submitting each one as a possible user ID. But let's take a look at that login form for pseudo random. Now technically, we're going to use the login form that comes with the uh, membership plugin that pseudorandom is using. By the way, the membership plugin, for anyone who's curious, is called MemberPress. Um, it's just one that I chose for this demo. Uh, not an endorsement or, or, or not speaking to it you know, either way. Uh, just the reason I mention that is because what we're about to see, is let's say we try some uh, invalid username or email address. So we'll say john at jdo.org, password of some sort. And it says, your username and password is incorrect. Now let's say we try a valid username or a valid email. What might we use as a valid email address? Well, how about this one right here at the bottom? It says, if you're having trouble logging in, please contact support or email admin at pseudorandom.org. Now, if we, didn't ha if we weren't quite this lucky with a, with a customer, although you'd be surprised how often customers are, are good about putting contact information for, uh, for their help desk and stuff like that online. We, could, we have a number of other options, perhaps. Um, if we didn't have an email address that we wanted to use to uh, see what a valid uh, 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 user login but invalid password looks like, we could do reconnaissance. We could take a look at the Whois information. 
uh, a number of different options that we, we cover uh, in more depth in Security 560. So let's try this admin at pseudorandom.org. And again, we'll try an invalid password. So now we're looking at the response for valid username, invalid password. And we'll notice it's the same. Error, your username or password is incorrect. So we've kind of got a problem now. Technically, from a, uh, secure, from a, uh, a security perspective, the customer is basically saying, well, or uh, excuse me, from a web perspective, the customer is basically saying, it doesn't matter. We're not going to tell you specifically whether it's a username or password that was invalid. We're just going to tell you one of the two. And in terms of security, this is the right thing to do. Um, right, this is how customers, at least one way, that, one thing that customers need to do to help fix this. Now, I do want to point out, what we're talking about right now is everything we're seeing on the screen. It's quite possible that if we were to do a right-click view source, that we might find... Oh, oh there we go. Reload. Continue. There we go. Sorry. It's quite possible that if we were to uh, do a view source that we might find some hidden form field or something that allows us to differentiate between the two. As it turns out right now, that's not actually the route we're going to take. Um, the, there is, as far as I can tell, no difference initially. So what do we do at this point in time? All right, are, we kind of, uh, are we kind of stuck without a, uh, up a creek without a paddle? What are we going to do? And the answer to this lies in the idea that we just need some page to submit usernames or identifiers. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be the login page. Now, it commonly is, and I'll be honest, of all the pen tests that I've got, that, uh, that I've conducted over the past seven years, um, at least 80% of the time, the login page, whether it's in plain H, whether it's in a, a rendered or viewable HTML, like in a web browser, or actually in the HTML source, you just don't see it like a hidden form field, 80% of the time, actually probably a little bit more, um, you'll be able to, just from the login page, be able to differentiate between the two. Now, we, uh, in our case, we don't have that option. The trick is we don't need just a login page. It can be anything. So, for example, a password reset page is another fantastic way. In fact, I've yet to come across an ad, a, web, a customer where if they had the uh, login page actually properly, <coughs> excuse me, the error messages from the login page properly uh, consistent, that the password reset page, we just went to that. That's, that's kind of like my default go-to. Excuse me, just at the cough there. Um, all failing that, or should you decide to do something else for a path other than the password reset page? There's also another classic is, um, especially on a member-based site where there's like forums and things of that nature, is going through and looking at, let's say, the uh, uh, membership profile page. So you go to look up the profile for an individual member. Many times it'll tell you whether or not the member exists or not, which again allows us to verify or differentiate between valid and invalid user IDs. Or the account creation page might be saying, how can you do that with the account creation page? Very simple. Many websites don't allow you to create an account with a user ID that already exists. And actually, I've been, I've been getting more and more interested in this last one. Um, it's the non-browser-based login methods, especially for web-based apps. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, how do you have a web app without a browser login method? Well, what I mean by this is, if you think about what a web app is, and we go into this in, in 560, it's the idea that... Uh, it's really just something that speaks. It's a server, right, that speaks HTTP. Typically, you access it with a web browser, but you don't have to. Uh, many of your mobile mobile device applications, so for instance, the mobile uh, WordPress app on, on your Android or your iOS device, what that's actually doing is accessing your web application, your WordPress installation via HTTP. It's just not using the uh, login page. It's, ac it's accessing it through... Um, uh, the H, uh, another API mechanism, but still all over HTTP. So uh, what will happen is a lot of, especially uh, uh, third-party plugins or developers, what they'll do is they'll enable access, you know, or enable some type of security mechanism such as consistent error messages at the regular web browser's login page. However, they don't do any of that type of information if you're accessing it via their quote-unquote API or their HTTP-based API. Uh, very, very powerful me uh, mechanism. There's a lot of stuff that, that we're starting to uh, explore that it's almost like everything old is new again. Um, we found one case where we're actually able to get SQL injection at an, at a lot, at, uh, in user credentials via the API versus just going ahead and submitting it via uh, the, uh, the front end. 
I really like that last one. So let's take a look at our password reset page for pseudo random. So if it says lost password, let's go ahead and see what happens. So let's enter an invalid username. We'll say john at j.org for john at john doe. And it says that username or email wasn't found. Now notice we don't even have the option of telling us if the password was invalid because, well, it's not asking us for one. So let's try entering admin at, well, that was a uh, hit enter a little too early there, admin at pseudo random. And it says successfully requested a password reset. Ah, sweet. So we can now use this to differentiate between the two. There's another thing to notice. It says enter your username or email address. I use the email address for demonstration. However, the fact that it says username, which is the same, to, which for right now is the same as user ID, is effectively what we what allows us to use this this password reset page as our way of differentiating between valid versus invalid. Now, one thing I do want to point out with it when you, if you're using a password reset page is that if when you get the successful um, or when you when you find a valid user ID, the user for that will be getting a password reset email. Now, you might be saying, well, gee, won't that alert the customer? And from a value perspective, we actually want customers to be able to, to, to be able to respond to this. I've yet to actually have it cause a message because how many users do you think actually go ahead and call the help desk and say, why did I just randomly get this password reset email? It's surprisingly few. Um, I know it happens all the time. Sometimes it happens just randomly. Uh, someone might have accidentally misentered an email, something like that, when they, when they were trying to reset their password. So you will be generating noise, so to speak, right? You will be generating a signal that is detectable. Um, however, and we'll talk about that when it comes to remediation. However, from terms of benefit to the customer, it's actually better if well, we want them to be able to catch this. It's a good thing. We want our customers to be secure. So now, once we've figured out the page that we're going to that we're going to use, this password reset, we need to view the we need to uh, note down the information that we're going to use. So let's go ahead and take a look at the source code to this page. Let's take a look at some of the form fields that are sent back and forth. By the way, right-click view source, another place to get possible emails, possible for harvesting usernames, things that are user identifiers, that type of thing. All right. So we scroll down, go through lots of this HTML. We get down to this page where it actually says request password reset. Enter your username or email. And notice the input field is the name is mepper, user, or email. So if we, when we submit a form, when we submit a request, this is where, this is the variable name or the form field name that we'll actually use for submitting our email address. And then there's this other thing down here. This uh, it's called the hidden form field. It's type hidden, but it's name mepper process uh, forgot password form value is true. And we'll notice for every time we load this page, this value will always be true. It's a static value. Now through experimentation, we would find out that if we actually submitted a request without this specific field set to true, it wouldn't process for us, at least not correctly. Excuse me. Now, we're viewing this, we're finding these by right-click view source going through the HTML source code. Another option, and one that we actually that I actually use a lot, um, sometimes, especially if the web the source code is very complex and we're trying to keep this within budget, is using something like Zap or Burp, uh, a, a HTTP web app attack proxy, and actually just looking at the traffic going back and forth. Heck, even if you didn't have Zap or Burp, Zap, of course, is free. Um, you could even just use something like TCP dump and just, you know, or, wire, or Wireshark or, or what have you, and just look at the network traffic going back and forth. The key here is to see what the web browser is going to submit when we try and uh, uh, enter a username or password, and then we'll mimic that within Python. So the form fields we need are the user, mepper, user, or email. Mepper, by the way, is short for member press. And then mepper pa process forgot password form. So here's our general approach for our tool. Now that we've gathered the information that we need, let's talk about actually building the tool. So basically, we're going to build up a list of possible user IDs. And then for each possible user ID, we'll submit, we'll submit it to the reset page, which means we need to go ahead and build a request, send the request, read the response. Now, if the response contains the string error, that means we had an invalid password or excuse me, an invalid user ID. So if the uh, string error is not in the response, the opposite of that, right? If it's not in the response, then we'll go ahead and print the user ID to the screen. So 
So let's go ahead and take a look at some code. Where did, oh, there you are. All right, so VI account harvester. And here is uh, so basically our pseudocode. So the first thing, what I've done is I've gone through and taken uh, the pseudocode that we just saw and turned it into uh, almost like a skeleton. These are all pi these uh, green lines that we see here are all Python comments. So we've got a function up here called isValidUserID, which we'll get to in just a sec. It's actually going to be the heart of our function. And here's our main loop down here at the bottom. So the first thing we need to do is generate a list of valid user IDs. And as we mentioned before, the way we're going to do this is simply with just, uh, excuse me, um, uh, a, a simple for loop. We're going to generate a, uh, all uh, user IDs we're going to check from 0 through 9999, or excuse me, 0 through 999. So we'll say uh, user IDs, oops. So what I'm doing here, uh, there we go, is creating a variable called user IDs to check, and we're basically assigning to that variable a list of numbers, which is going to range up to, but not including, 1,000. So 0 through 999. We're calling this variable user IDs to check. Then for each user ID, Then while we actually have, oops, hit the F1 key there. While we actually have user IDs to check, let's do this. We'll do user ID equals user IDs to check dot pop zero. What we're doing is we're removing one, we're removing the first item off of the user IDs to check list. So we're going to go in a loop. While we have user IDs to check, each iteration through the loop, we'll take one off. We'll format it properly. We'll say user ID equals user ID, oops, percent 03F, I, modulo, user ID. So what this line here is doing is formatting our user ID properly so it has at least three characters, and uh, uh, even if it's less than 100, let's say 99, it'll always have at least three characters and pad out with zero as necessary. This is related to that formatting that we saw before. And then here we need to actually check to see if our user ID is valid. So we'll say if is valid user, user ID, user ID, then print to the screen, print valid user ID, and we should be good. So. Uh, By the way, the, the comments that I put at the bottom, that what we call the closing comments, so like the end if, end while, those are just so I know I can see visually where, what my uh, function looks like, where my loops are, stuff like that. So what we've done now is we've actually built up the main body of our code. It's going through generating a list of possible user IDs. For each user ID, we'll go ahead and get that user ID, format it as a string properly, and check to see if it's valid. If it is, we'll go ahead and print it to the screen. So now here we need to build up the heart of our function, which is the isValidUserID function. This is what actually checks to see if it is valid, does the, HTTP, does the web request. So the first thing that we'll do is build up the request. To do this, we'll create a re uh, request object. Now the request object takes a few parameters. One of them is the URL that we want to submit to. So in this case, it'll be HTTP colon whack whack, can't type, www.pseudorandom.org slash login slash question mark action equals forgot password. That's spelled properly, yes. The next thing is we actually have to give it the data, in this case, the user ID. So to do this, you, you when you're creating your request object, you tell the data parameter equals, and then you have to do it, oops, a urllib.encode. This should be urllib2. urllib.urlencode. And you give it a Python dictionary. Specifically, we'll say the two fields. The static one, the mepper 
process forgot password form, which is always going to be true. And the second one will be mepper user, oops, mepro, mepper user or email, which will be our user ID. So what this is basically doing is allowing us to tell or allowing us to specify what we want as our form data to be sent across. The static value of mepper process forgot password also be true. Mepper user or email uh, is the user ID. Then we're going to go ahead and send the request. Read the HTML response. And let's convert it to lowercase. The reason I'm doing this is so that way uh, I can check to see if the lowercase string error is in there. So what we're doing is reading the HTML response. That's the dot read part of this. And then we're just going to go ahead and convert that string, that HTML string, all to lowercase. Since I'm not trying to display anything to the screen, I'm not, not too concerned about, uh, about everything being lowercase. But it does make my life easier as a software developer because I can do if error not in HTML return true. So what this is saying is if the lowercase string error is not, in H is not in the HTML response that we got back, go ahead and return true. Because if error is there, that means the user ID was invalid. So let's go ahead and uh, save this to a file. And let's uh, fire this up. Oh, we have a small problem. Let's make sure mapper process pseudorandom.org forgot password form true mapper user or email user ID response you're allowed to if error not in HTML return true return false. Let's see, copy. Take a look. So we actually do have a ready-to-go copy just in case something, as I was telling Ed earlier, I do have backup copies in case the quote-unquote internet catches fire, which I'm assuming I must have made a typo in the previous code because... Let's rerun this. Here we go. I'm not sure what the typo was in the previous in when I first typed it up. I'll go back through the webcast afterwards and double check. By the way, while that's running, we'll just advance the slides. Now, as we mentioned before, as this is running, um, when we get these valid user IDs, the, the corresponding users will actually be getting password resets. Um, that's just kind of the nature of the game. If you're doing something like if you chose to go through the approach of looking at like a membership profile page to query an individual member's uh, profile or the account creation page, then they won't be getting password resets. I actually kind of like the mem the, um, uh, the member profile pages on pages where it's, where it's uh, an option just because, especially on public websites, those type of pages are crawled by Google a lot, so you're very likely to blend in with a lot of the existing Google traffic. Um, and they don't generate a lot of noise, meaning if you make a request for an invalid membership page, I mean, it generates the usual, each, you know, whatever the web server uh, logs are generated. However, uh, a user won't get an email address or won't get an uh, email or anything like that. So it works out quite well. So as we can see, this is running, uh, and it'll take another minute or so. But once it's done, this is what the output will look like. We'll get 11 different valid user identifiers. Now, as you can see, they're actually in numeric order. The reason for this is not because they weren't generated pseudo-randomly. This is just the order that we test them in. So, and it ranges all the way from 0 to 4 all the way up through 916. It's about halfway done. It'll take another couple of minutes or so. So while that's running, let's talk about the next half of this, which is building a password guesser. So now that we've got valid user IDs, we still need the other half of the, of the credential problem, the password. 
And as we can see here, Sherlock Holmes says, I never guess. Well, apparently, Sherlock Holmes does not use password guessers. But since he's a fictitious character, we'll move on. Now, the general idea is kind of building upon the account harvesting, is take that list of account uh, user, or excuse me, user IDs, and just try a list of common uh, different passwords. Now, for this class, or for this uh, webcast, excuse me, uh, we'll be using the uh, password list that comes with John the, uh, John the Ripper. It's fantastic, um, works out well. Another thing that we're going to be depending upon is that the fact that WordPress doesn't have account lockout. Believe it or not, vanilla WordPress does not have any type of account lockout functionality. Now, there are third-party, basically, additions that you can, you know, plugins that you can add to WordPress, but vanilla WordPress installs don't have it. Also, by the way, if anyone who happens to see John Strand, do not tell them that I released, that I revealed his three, top three root passwords in this webcast. That's what's over here on the right-hand side. No one knows John's secret root passwords. Now, the approach we'll take for building the password guesser is very similar to that as we did with the account harvesting. We already know what the login page is. Um, we just need to record some relevant form data. So here we're done with our password guessing, to, with our um, uh, account harvesting. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, login page source code. Uh, zoom out. So we'll go to account, login, right click, view page source. Now this one's got a little bit more complex in terms of the information we need. Specifically, it's uh, just got a few more uh, uh, variables. But here we'll see that we need the log. Well, so first of all, the URL that we'll be submitting to is pseudorandom.org slash login. Then the username itself, we specified as the log variable. The password is pwd. Now, we have some other ones in here. For instance, remember me, which is that little checkbox which says, do you want to stay logged in? And I like this. It says value forever. This is, whenever I see this, I always think, hmm, that, we'll come back to that later. And then it says, mepper process login form of value equals true. So out of all of the different uh, uh, form fields, those that are visible, such as log and password, and those that are hidden, such as mepper process login form, we only need those. We only need the log, password, and mepper process login form to, to submit. Now, technically, if we weren't doing this uh, uh, in a webcast, how would we know that we only need those three? Well, we could fire up Zap or Burp, take a look at um, what's actually being submitted back and forth, or in the case of a uh, publicly available off-the-shelf uh, uh, solution, such as WordPress, Drupal, a number of those types of uh, popular PHP frameworks, you can actually just download it, recreate the environment yourself, and see what is that, and t or take a look at the code and see what's necessary. So specifically, we'll take the URL. The username will be called log. I assume that's for login. PWD for password and the method process login form, that's always set to be true. So our pseudocode is actually going to be, for the password guesser, is going to be very, very similar to that for our account harvester. We're going to build up a list of possible passwords. Then for each valid user ID, we're going to submit the user ID and password to the login page, which means we build up a form request, or build up an HTTP request with our form data, just like before, send the response, read the result. If error is not in the response, uh, we assume that the user ID password pair we submitted was correct and displayed to the screen. So let's take a look at the password guesser.py script. So very much like before, we're going to have two functions. One that actually does the verification and one is our main loop. So start off by taking a look at our main loop. So the first thing we're going to do is build up a list of possible passwords. To do this, we mentioned we're going to use the file uh, password.lst. It's John the Ripper's default password file. So the first line uh, basically opens, reads the file, reads all the lines of the file, and saves that to the variable, or assigns that to the variable called passwords. Basically, that's going to be our list of possible passwords. Then we've created a list of user IDs the output from this, where do we get this list? It was the output of the account harvesting script, exactly. Then for each user ID, each individual user ID in our list of user IDs, 
we're going to try each possible password. So what we're going to do is we're going to call the credentials are valid function. So if the credentials are valid, we'll print them to the screen. Now, it's, we have this break down here, this, because if you think about it, once we find a valid password for a given user ID, we don't, need to get, we don't need to try more passwords for that user ID. We already found the valid one. So by calling break, it'll take us out of this for loop, the for password one, and we'll continue going to the next user ID. So break will take us out of basically this portion right here. So it'll take us out of this loop and allow us to go forward with the next user ID. Basically, it's more efficient. All right. Now, the next thing that we have to take a look at is the credentials are valid function, which, if you'll notice, it's actually very similar to our account harvesting function. In fact, other than the variables we're submitting, it's identical. So we build up our HTTP request. To do this, we create a request object. We pass it the URL different URL, but exact same uh, parameter. And we also give it URL encoded data. We're URL encoding a Python dictionary of the forms we want to submit, or the, excuse me, the fields we want to submit, which is the log, the username, what we're calling user ID, password, PWD, which is the password, and the static form value of member process login form of always being true. We submit it, we read the response, and then we're checking to see if error is in the response. If error is not in the response, then we assume that our request was valid, or that our, our, our combination was valid, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. Now, one thing I want to note that we didn't, that was a little bit different from the account harvester, was down here where it says password.strip. What we're actually doing is when we read the lines of, of, of passwords out of password.lst, it's one password per line, at the end of each line is a new line character. So technically, if we don't call dot strip, the password we're trying is whatever string you see on the screen plus the new line character. Depending on how your web app uh, and how your application is written, that might make a difference or not. So it's all uh, if you know that the passwords are not going to contain the new line character, which I've yet to encounter an application that allowed you to enter a new line as the as part of the password. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I just I haven't encountered any during a test. Um, you would need to uh, uh, call strip. So we write this out. We save it. And let's go ahead and run Python password guesser. And here it's printing to the screen some of the credentials that we're finding. So for the different accounts, we now have the various different passwords. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, matrix, let me in, help me, A1, B2, C3, change me. And we've got a few others coming up as well. Oh, change me again. Oh no, that's there. Coffee, password. wizard and password one. Very, very secure. And we should have one more. So what we're doing is, for, again, for each one of these user IDs, we're checking each possible password. Ah, trust no one. That's our Fox Mulder account. Now, it's, with these usernames and passwords, this is not the end of, of, of the road. This is just the beginning. Right? This is now we've got access. Now we get to do all the fun stuff, which comes, which by fun stuff, I mean report writing, right? Yes. All right. So what are some of the ways we can enhance our tool sets? Uh, what we looked at today was a very, very um, fundamental uh, uh, examination of, of what the core process is. As many of you are aware, there are a number of different uh, uh, directions that we could have gone. For instance, what about dealing with a CAPTCHA? Um, in the 573 class, the Python for Pentester class, they actually talk about some of the options. Um, if it's something simple like a math captcha, which, by the way, is one of the latest in security enhancements for WordPress to help stop brute force login attempts, exactly what we're doing. Um, the math captcha, you literally read the, math, they really read the HTML, solve the math problem, and submit that as part of your response. Um, there's also captcha solving services if it's like a picture-based captcha. Uh, the other thing is we really didn't talk about any type of uh, major authentication mechanism. So, for instance, what, uh, if you need to, uh, if there's HTTP-based authentication with a basic uh, uh, digest, that type of thing, or even session identifiers. Luckily for us, WordPress is such that it's, it's, uh, there's not a lot of data that needs to go back and forth. But when you're working against a custom web app, you never really know. Plus cookies. Um, 
session ceiling and with session hijack, we talk about some cool stuff on 560 with some neat attacks against cookies and, and that type of thing. But when it comes to writing your tools, you need to be able to, some, some, some applications actually require you to submit your request with a cookie. And there are actually ways to do that within Python. They have a whole cookie handling framework. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with Python that takes that batteries included approach. Plus the result checking. The reason we were able to, che to check uh, for the string error was because when we were successful, error was not actually in our login or excuse me, was not in the result page. So for instance, if we take a look at, so let's just go ahead and account log in. Uh, what was one of the passwords that we had? Uh, 916, trust no one. 916, trust no one. Notice it takes us back to the home page. Now technically we can access the back end and stuff like that. And I know for those of you that are trying to log in right now, trust me, I've got another window open with the uh, tailing the uh, the uh, Apache log. Um, no, it's none of these are privileged accounts. I did not. I'm obviously not going to put the username and password for an admin account, even on a demo system. Um, so we, for uh, uh, result checking, uh, rather than just looking for the string error, we can look to see what the error. Uh, we can do a little bit more robust. And perhaps the other thing is sometimes when you're doing uh, guessing. Um, or uh, uh, harvesting accounts for account harvesting, uh, and you have to use the and you're using the login page. Sometimes you actually do get a valid user ID and password, so you want to be able to check that too because there's no point in throwing away your hard work. Now, what about account lockout? Because even though it doesn't come stock with WordPress, there, is, there are a number of options for that. Well, the first and uh, most obvious approach would be just to add delays, so you don't trigger account lockout. This is more for our password guessing. Um, now, that might take longer, which if you bill by there, absolutely fantastic. No, but seriously, um, adding a delay will help avoid doing the account lockout approach, or you just limit the number of attempts per, um, th that you make per, per account. Plus, we have a, if you take 5, 6, we'll go, we actually go into depth on, there's a number of different options you have, because password guessing goes well beyond just writing your tools to password guessing. Also, there's a neat technique called password spraying, which is based on the idea of, rather than lots of passwords for a few number of accounts, Let's do lots of accounts with a few number of passwords. And the number of passwords that we try per account is just below the lockout threshold. Also, another major enhancement, um, as, much as, uh, as much as I like to joke about billable hours, right? being a consultant, that's all great. However, uh, our Python code was single-threaded. It was actually relatively slow. There are several ways to speed this up, ironically. Um, so one, one of them is being multi-threaded. Now, in terms of... Um, customer value. Remember, at the end of the day, writing tools is great and being, you know, leap pen testing ninjas, fantastic. However, no matter how skilled you are, there's of no value to the customer until they can actually take what you, you know, the, the results of your pen testing work and turn them into fixes, basically. The whole goal of the pen test is not to break in. In fact, I've yet to, I say this now, I better knock on wood, I've yet to encounter a customer where we didn't break in where we were not able to compromise them. The only time that it starts, we start running into, I guess, start getting concerned is when we have a very tight budget to meet. Now, mind you, this doesn't necessarily mean we get domain admin on every single customer, but that's also not our goal. Sometimes our goal really is just to get data. Now, and I say that, I know it sounds, it sounds almost kind of pretentious. It's because, the, it's just because of the amount of um, uh, uh, effort and thoroughness that we go through when it comes to when we when it comes to doing a pen test for a customer, then again these engagements aren't like a two week engagement either. Um, they usually are. They usually do cover quite cover quite a bit. And the reason I say this is because at the end of the day, when we're providing value to a customer, what are some of the things they could do to fix this type of problem? The account harvesting and password guessing. Well, first of all, ironically, with a company named Pseudo Random, their user IDs aren't pseudo random enough. Um, actually, it's just they were generated with simple PHP random uh, of a string of, of digits 0 through 9. So obviously not pseudo-random enough, too predictable. They could allow users to use an email address, which is only kind of delaying the problem a little bit. Because technically, then we had to go through and generate a list of possible email addresses. So it's making the attacker's life harder, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It just realizes it's, it's not a perfect fix. We could also, uh, when it comes to the password reset page, uh, perhaps create some code that looks for a large number of password reset emails being sent out. Or even better, and this is what many, uh, especially like banks and stuff do, are security questions when you try and go ahead and reset your password. These are kind of like CAPTCHAs, except they, uh, many of them that are free form effectively become a much more difficult problem to solve. Now, in the case of something like that, if you can count that during a pen test, don't forget 
all you need is some page that allows a differentiate between the two. And honestly, that's where I like taking a look at the um, the non-browser based uh, uh, access. So API, the, the same APIs that like your mobile device uh, applications use. Also, detecting brute force, uh, some type of uh, plugin or code to detect brute force login attempts. There are many plugins on WordPress that do this. Many of them even have account lockout functionality. But at the end of the day, brute force uh, uh, login detection, whether you're using CAPTCHAs, stuff like that, or if you're just um, trying to detect you know, failed number, number of failed attempts, really one thing that helps uh, reduce this significantly is to have multi-factor authentication. Now nothing's perfect, but multi-factor authentication does significantly uh, uh, decrease the uh, ease with which an attacker can uh, conduct something like a password guessing attack. So to kind of summarize, we saw how to get valid user credentials. We saw that building your own tools isn't that difficult. It doesn't really take much work, especially um, if you're doing it in something like Python. But it's, and it's definitely worth it, especially for those customers where their environment is just different enough that your out-of-the-box tools don't work quite as, quite as expected. And at the end of the day, the value from a pen test really comes, on, comes from how you can take this information and help the customer become more secure. All right. So that ends the uh, presentation portion of this webcast. I do want to mention again um, that uh, if you have any questions, uh, that please go ahead and type them into the window, uh, chat window. I know, Ed, you've been noting down any questions that have been coming through? We've got a lot of questions, and there's some really good ones, so I hope people can stick with us for just a little bit to go through some of these questions. We'll, we'll hit them pretty quick, though. The thing I like so much about these questions, oh, by the way, great job, Mike. Thank you for oh, that. Thank you. Um, really, really useful. In particular, the thing I like about these questions is people want to do this. They want to practice. I could tell from several of the questions. First, Corey says, you've got a bunch of code samples in here. Can mm -hmm. you publish those on something like maybe GitHub or something like that? Sure. Actually, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll make them available on Bitbucket. Um, so that's, that's where I use to post a lot of my uh, open source stuff. Um, what will happen is if you, after this presentation is over, uh, sure, uh, within a little bit later, they're actually going to um, post the slides for this. What I'll do is I'll add a little note on one of the slides uh, to the URL, but it'll be under bitbucket.org uh, under social exploits. Perfect. Also, if you, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll also make an announcement on Twitter as well. That's great. And sort of the follow-up to Corey's question about can you post the, uh, the code is Brian's question saying, hey, is it, and, and you got to respect Brian for asking this question, is it okay for us to mess with pseudorandom.org? On our own time. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Um, yeah. Okay, so I stood up pseudo random for this demonstration, uh, and it's it's a box I have hosted over at Linode, which, uh, by the way, is at, um, they, they they you can conduct pen tests from Linode, so they're they're pretty good about this type of thing. However, um, I will be taking it down probably within the next few days, just because of the fact that um, uh, it's. Uh, I don't want to leave a vulnerable WordPress site sitting out connected to the public. What I will do is uh, on the uh, uh, the Bitbucket uh, um, repo, I'll put in a, a backup of the non-sensitive, i.e. Uh, not the admin user and stuff like that, uh, data. So if you want to recreate some of uh, uh, pseudo-random, you can feel free to do so. That's cool. I appreciate it. Because, I mean, the, the thing that Corey and Brian are, are talking about here is, hey, we want to practice. And oh, yeah. that would be cool. Several other folks asked about whether the recording is going to be available. Andy asked about that. Um, uh, let's see. Stuart asked about that. Yeah, the recording is going to be available. Uh, Trevor is our uh, recording engineer, and he is recording this right now. Um, and we'll make that available to you as well so you can listen to it again, go through in more detail um, you know, any of the examples and such, especially once you've downloaded the code. Um, Another question here from uh, Jeremy. Jeremy says, um, concerning sites like Pastebin, where we should check if accounts are already compromised? Do you have like a, a set of favorite places to look to see if a, an account has been compromised? Um, Mike, I have okay. some suggestions if you don't, but if you've got some ideas, that's cool. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, oh, I mean, feel free to add to this. I was going to say Pastebin, uh, obviously, as we mentioned, Pasty, P-A-S-T-I-E, is another classic one. Also. Yep. Uh, if you check through some of the Google dorks on um, on the Google Hacking Database, uh, those are also there are some good ones in there as well. Ed, yep. So there's a couple. There's one that's actually performing kind of slow today. But have I been pwned? Let me see. Let me send this to all. 
haveibendpwn.com is by Troy Hunt. He's a Microsoft MVP, and he's collected a whole bunch of these lists and makes it available for free. There's also one uh, called, da, 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 let me go ahead and try to type that in here. Okay, great. Now I can't type in anymore. Well, there's one at Rehman, R-E-H-M-A-N-N dot C-O. Raymond dot C-O, R-E-H-M-A-N-N dot C-O. That's Mark Burnett's publication. It allows you to do searches for partial usernames, so you don't even have to type in the entire username, and that, uh, that one works well. Um, the, um, the other one is Pwned List, but that's a commercial one. You have to pay for that. So the Raymond List that I gave you, that one's free, and uh, the Have I Been Pwned one is free, but Pwned List is a commercial one. Um, the Have I Been Pwned one also has this interesting property in that there is a Recon NG module that integrates with it. There's also a Recon NG module for integrating with Pwned List, uh, but again, you have to have a commercial license for that one. So, so those are good, good questions. Thank you for that, uh, Jeremy. There were also some people who um, were trying to troubleshoot your Python in real time. Um, and uh, we're talking about HT use of HTML.lower. Uh, on input and output and so forth. So uh, we also had a nice request, uh, somebody saying, hey, can you start over? I got in a little late. But it'll all be recorded for you so you can get that as well. Um, so so those were, were some really wonderful questions. Thank you for the, the great material there, Mike. Uh, I do want to remind people that Mike Murr, the gentleman whom you just heard, is going to be teaching SAN Security 560 on network pen testing and ethical hacking. It's coming up in a month in San Diego. The weather is beautiful there. It's a great time to be in San Diego. May 4th through 12th is when the entire event runs. He'll be running 560 over six days there, covering a lot of topics. But how the, the focus of the class is how to do an effective penetration test. And Mike is an excellent teacher on that. In addition to the 560 class, there's a whole bunch of other courses there. Courses on continuous monitoring, uh, Mac forensics analysis is a, a newer course that they're going to be running there, cyber threat intelligence, a whole lot more. And they're going to have these wonderful panels on emerging trends in information security. If you look at the URL that um, Mike's um, taskbar is obscuring right now, you can see that it's at sans.org slash, thank you, Mike, sans.org slash Security West. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us. Be on the lookout for uh, the recording for this thing. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Mike, do you have any closing thoughts for anybody? Um, other than thank you, everyone, for coming out. I understand that it is a Good Friday, and it's in some people in the middle of the day, some people's afternoon, and I'm sure some people around the world in the morning. Thank you again for coming out. I really do appreciate it. I look forward to seeing everyone at a uh, Future Sands event. Good stuff, guys. Thanks. Take care. Have a great weekend.